Praise the Lord. We welcome every one of you to the Bible study tonight in Jesus' name. Let's close our eyes as we pray. And Father, we thank you tonight for our Bible study. We bless your name for what we're looking at today. You are the God of today, the God of yesterday, and the God of tomorrow. We are just people of yesterday. Our life is so short and so brief, and we do not have the wisdom we ought to have. And it is not in man to guide himself in a step-by-step, day-to-day, things that he ought to do. But we know that if you are with us, your wisdom will be with us. You will guide us. You will lead us. You will map out a plan before us. And our lives will be useful in Jesus' name. We pray that as we study tonight, you open our eyes to behold wondrous things out of your word. And we pray as a result of the study, we'll become wiser in the Lord, stronger in the Lord, and we'll be able to move on steadfastly in the future ahead of us. And the mistakes of the past will not destroy the prospects of the future in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name, we pray. Today, we're in James chapter 4. And in James chapter 4, we're looking at verses 13 all through to 16. Please open your Bible as we read the text. Go to now, ye that say, Today or tomorrow we will go into such a city, and continue there a year, and buy and sell, and get gain. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even as a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. For that ye ought to say, If the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. But now ye rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. As say, uh, you must have followed along if you've been studying this epistle of James with us. You will see that the epistle of James is very practical. And today we come to a very practical lesson. And it's telling us the difference between the religious and the righteous. It tells us as you grow up in life from childhood to adolescence and you get to your manhood and you become older you will know that there is something very, very important. And that is planning. You plan. You plan each day in the previous day. You plan the coming week at the end of the previous week. And at the end of the year, if you are a normal person, you plan ahead wanting to know what will be in the coming year. In fact, there are companies that will plan five years ahead of time, ten years ahead of time. I even read of a particular institution that planned a hundred years ahead of time. What's going to be the stage and the condition of the company in so many years ahead? And so planning is something very important. In fact, some people say, if you fail to plan, you're planning to fail. But there's a difference between the religious and the righteous. The righteous person, he plans with God. But the religious fellow, the one that just goes to church, but doesn't have the real life of a Christian, he plans without God. And that's what James is talking about in the verses that we have read. We're talking about the danger of planning without God. No problem with planning. We ought to plan. We ought to look ahead. We ought to see where we're going and think before we leave. But if we are Christians, we plan with God. James draws the picture of a religious man who plans his business and he plans his progress without God. He's telling us the portrait of somebody that may call, that he may say he believes in God, but he's, a, he's an atheist in practical terms. Because the practice of planning his life without God shows that in practical terms, it's like he doesn't know that God exists at all. Many recipients of this epistle were Jews who were also great traders and business people. 
they sought and they moved into cities and they wanted business and sought uh, trading opportunities. Some of them were immersed in their business pursuits, but then they forgot God. See their language that God is not in any of their thoughts. You see that in that verse 13. Look at your Bible again. It says, go to now. It calls them, it's like an exclamation. It says, come. It says, learn. It says, have you been planning without God? Go to now. Ye that say, they say it without God. They say it without prayer. They say it without leaning upon the Lord. Ye that say, today or tomorrow, we will go into such a city and continue thy year and buy and sell and get gain. And then James tells them the foolishness of doing that. He tells them the unreasonableness of their action, of their planning. He says, whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow, and then you are planning for the next year. For what's your life? Is it not even a vapor that appears now for a little while and then vanishes away? And so you understand then this is practical atheism. Living and planning as if God did not exist. As if only on one day of the week we remember God. But during the week, all through that week, all the activities are carried out without any reference to God. And without any remembrance of Him. How can we plan our future without God? When we don't even know what shall be on the morrow. In fact, we are told in uh, Proverbs chapter 27. Look at your Bible, Proverbs. You may even want to mark it in your Bible. Proverbs chapter 27 and reading there in verse 1. Tells us how we ought to be wise. Tells us how to think of time. It tells us how to think of the future. It says in that uh, verse 1, Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. It says we need God, because he's the one that was and is and will come. He's the eternal one. The one that was there yesterday is there today and will be there tomorrow. And he's already there tomorrow before we ever get there. And therefore he knows about it, knowing then from the beginning we plan with him. The true Christian then is the one that commits himself and commits his future and commits his plans into the hands of God. Desiring only God's purpose, only God's will to be done and to be fulfilled. The future is not in the hands of men. And no man can boast or arrogantly claim that he has power to decide on the future. There are three points we're going to look at as we divide the passage into three parts. Number one, planning without God. Number two, the presumption of the godless. Then number three, the priority of the godly. Let's come back to number one, planning without God. I come back to that verse again. I'm looking at verse 13 of James chapter 4. Go to now. You see that word, those words, go to now. As you look at the New Testament, they appear only two times in the whole of the New Testament. Once in chapter 4 and once in chapter 5 of James chapter 5 verse 1. Go to now, ye rich men, weep and howl, for your mysteries shall, that shall come upon you. It appears whenever James wanted to talk about something that the people have been neglecting, overlooking, he wants to call them to attention. He wants to jolt them into, uh, into, uh, into attention. He wants to wake them up. And therefore he says, go to now. You people that have been planning without God. You people that have been running your life without God. Pay attention. Then he says, ye that say tomorrow or to today or tomorrow, we will go into such a city and continue there ye and buy and sell and get gain." You will see there that God is not involved in any way at all. The, the fear in the heart of anybody that knows the Bible is that 
that's exactly what Lucifer did. That's exactly what Satan did. And if there is anybody planning his life, eh, as I'm growing up, I'll finish school at this time. When I finish, I'll go to a certain institution. When I finish, I will get a job. When I finish, I'll buy a car. When I finish, at the age of 24, I'll get married. When I finish, I'm going to build a house. When I finish, I'm going to travel overseas. And God doesn't come into it at all. And God is not in the plan at all. And is planning without God. That's exactly how Lucifer, Satan, did. Look at Isaiah chapter 14. In Isaiah chapter 14. Reading there from verses 14 and 13 and 14. Isaiah chapter 14. Reading from verse 13. And see how Satan said, I will, I will, I will, a lot of times. But it's not planning with God, for thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. You will see the problem there. That's Satan planning. I will do this. I will become this. I will rise up to that level. And yet God is not involved at all. Do you know? Whenever you are like that, and you say, I will do this, I will do this, you don't pray about it, and you don't tell God, you don't ask God, what's his plan for you? He created you, and he saved you, and he put you into this world, and he has a plan, he has a purpose why you are here. You didn't ask him, you are just planning without God. It's like you are following the path and the way of Satan. Whether we're young or we're old, there is something we need to bear in mind. We do not know about the future, we do not know why we're here, we do not know what God has in mind we go and ask him then he will tell us what we ought to do and how we ought to do it in Luke chapter 12 Luke chapter 12 from verse 16 and he spake a parable unto them saying the ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully and he thought within himself that's the problem he thought within himself instead of praying to God Instead of laying the plan before God, instead of asking the Lord, where do I go? What do I do? How do I do it? He said, he thought within himself saying, what shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, this will I do. I will pull down my bands and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, so... Thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine easy drink and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? And then Jesus drew a lesson for everybody. So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. You see, the people that plan without God, suddenly they are removed from the earth. And, they, and the plans they had, and the things they thought they would do, the thing does not uh, get through. Because they were planning without God. But that's not just a modern problem. It's a, the problem is as old as the beginning of the world almost. Look at Genesis. Genesis chapter 11. Reading from verse 3. You will see people here, the people that knew not God, the people that followed not God, the people that didn't have God in their thoughts, in their plans, they too, they were planning what they will do, what they will build, and they wanted to do it without God. Genesis chapter 11 verse 3, and he said one to another, go to, that's it again, go to, let us make brick, and burn them thoroughly, and they add brick for stone. And slime they add for mortar. And he said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto the heavens, unto heaven. And let us make us a name, and, let, and lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language. And that this that they begin to do, 
Now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Go to. Let us go down. And they are confounded language that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of the earth and they left off to build the city. The problem is when you try to plan without God, and you think you can make it without God, God is not happy with it. And then he destroys the work of your hand because you are living like an atheist. On Sunday you say, I believe in God. He is my creator. He is my redeemer. He is my father. And then during the week, you don't even think about him. You go to places you want to go without thinking about him. And you plan everything you want to plan without talking to him. That's what James was concerned about. About these so-called believers who were planning their lives and planning their business affairs without God. And then he begins to tell, he tell them, stop, think, and uh, learn so that uh, something is wrong with the way you are planning your life. And if you have been planning, are you planning marriage? Is God in your thoughts? Are you asking God? Do you know God needs to lead you? Are you planning education, higher education? Are you asking God? Or are you taking all the decisions? This is what I'll do. This is where I'll go. Are you planning to have a family? Are you asking God at all? Is God in your plan? Is it a project? Is God in your plan? Do you want to travel overseas? And then uh, you are planning everything. You are planning for the visa. I'll go here. I'll go there. You have even chosen the country you want to go to. You call yourself a Christian. And yet you are not talking to God about it at all. That's not right. The Lord doesn't want his children to go in that direction. That's the way of the unbeliever. The way of the person that does not know God at all. In Second Chronicles chapter 18. Second Chronicles chapter 18. From verse 25. Second Chronicles 18.25. Then the king of Israel said, Take ye Micaiah and carry him back to Ammon, the governor of the city, and to Joash, the king's son, and say, Thus says the king, Put this fellow in the prison and feed him with the bread of affliction and with the water of affliction until I return in peace. He was thinking he was going to return in peace. And God was not in his thought. He didn't ask God. He didn't know whether he should go to the battle or not. And he didn't know whether he needed the help of God or not. But he said, imprison that man. Hold him down. And then give him water and bread of affliction. When I return, I'll deal with him. And then Micaiah said in verse 27, If thou certainly return in peace, then as not the Lord spoken by me. And he said, Hacking all ye people instead of repenting, Instead of knowing that he had gone astray and that he wasn't walking the right way, he was only pointing toward that man of God, what the prophet had said. We're not surprised because that's the way of the ungodly. And that's how all the ungodly people, how they do their things. Now let's look at Psalm 52. Psalm 52, reading there from verse 7. Psalm 52, verse 7. Lo, this is the man that made not God a strength, but trusted in the abundance of his riches and strengthened himself in his wickedness. It says, that's the way of the wicked. It's the way of the righteous. It says, this is the man that made not God a strength, but trusted in the abundance of his riches. There are people that trust in their wisdom. There are people that trust in their ability to plan by themselves and they will not bring God in. If you ask questions from many people that have done that, when they were counseled, pray. And pray very well before you get married, before you choose a life partner. And they just they prayed a little. They had their idols in their hearts. And they went to God. They said, God, I love this person. I like this person. Put your approval. Put your stamp on it. They are married now. And the trouble they are going through, they cannot tell it all. And that's the reason we're telling the people that have not taken success. Plan with God. 
pray very well before you get into any major thing in your life. Don't just move out of the city uh, before God really directs you. Sometimes you'll find one of the brothers or sisters and you'll say, oh, I've not seen you for a long time. Are you no more in Lagos? Oh, yes, I'm not in Lagos anymore, but I'm regretting the action already. Because things were difficult in the city, I thought, I had information that something is going on there, and I thought if I went there, I'll be able to make it. I didn't pray through. I didn't ask from God. I didn't get the plan from God. And I moved. I've gone there. I've lost everything that I took there. That's the danger of planning without God. In Ecclesiastes chapter 8. Ecclesiastes chapter 8. Verses 6 and 7. Ecclesiastes chapter 8. Reading from verse 6. Because to every purpose there is time and judgment. Therefore, the mystery, the mystery of man is great upon him. Why? Because in verse 7, he knoweth not that which shall be. For who can tell him what shall be? Only God can tell him. But God will not tell you if you don't ask him. If you are planning without God. If you do not bring God into your plan, if you do not ask God, what do I do? Where do I go? What decision do I take? If you don't ask God, it's not going to impose his decision, his plan upon you. Come back to James chapter 4, verse 13. There's something important for you to notice in that verse 13. Go to now. Ye that say, today or tomorrow, we will go into such a city. And continue there a year, and buy, and sell, and get gain. We need to talk to everyone that whether you are young or old, a student or an adult, planning is very important. And you will see the steps of the planning in that verse 13. There is nothing wrong with planning. What we are condemning, what the Bible is condemning, is uh, planning without God. But if you'll bring God in, if you'll get on your knees, if you pray to God, planning is a wonderful thing. And once you can pray, you will see the items and you will see the points of the planning there. Number one, they chose the time, today or tomorrow. Planning requires time. You're going to want to do something. Is it marriage? Is it education? Is it family? Is it raising children? Is it a project? Time. Consider the time. Number two, they chose the location for the business. And uh, you will see in that verse 13, they said, we will go into such a city. That is, they named the particular city, the location where the business will be done. You, you are planning and you need to plan. But you, you plan with God. There are things that will move in a, a particular city which will not move in another city. There are things that will go well and prosper in a particular community, even in the city here, which will not go well in another community. Therefore, you pray to God, you want to know the location for such a business. Number three, the duration. Then they said, they'll continue there a year. When you are planning, you don't have an eternity to do what you want to do. The time is short. Your planning must tell you, must tell you is it for one year, is it for two years, or is it, is it for more? But you are going to ask God. Number four, they chose the enterprise. In their own cases, to buy or sell. What is it you will pray? The Lord knows your ability, knows your skill. What skill has the Lord given you? That if you apply that skill in the wisdom of God, in the way of God, and according to the plan and purpose of God for your life, that your life, you'll make progress. There must be a particular thing. And then number five, they chose the goal. And the objective, the goal is, and get gain. They didn't just want to walk, just to be walking. They wanted gain. As I've told you, it's very important that we plan. The only problem is that they were planning without God. Now you are Christians and you must plan with God. Now, what are the steps you take? Let me summarize that part before I go to point number two. Number one, commence with prayer. You are planning, commence with prayer. And when you go to God, don't have an idol in your heart. Don't say, this is what I must do. But so and so is uh, having a school. I too, I must have a school. No, no, no. Commence with prayer. Number two, construct the plan. 
after you have prayed, while you are praying, the Lord will be ministering to you and talking to your heart and pointing things out to you. You construct the plan. Number three, choose the place. Where is the place where that plan will be effected, where that project will be done? Number four, chart the progress. If you want to make a progress with God, you are planning everything. If I put this in and the Lord blesses you the way the Lord is communicating with my heart and this is the gain that will come then I will plow it back to it again and this will be the result calculate the profit that's the next step and then after you've done that conclude with prayer commence with prayer conclude with prayer we go to point number two now the presumption of the godless you see really the problem with these people that uh, James was saying they didn't do right. He tells us about the presumption in James chapter 4. James chapter 4, reading from verse 14. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanishes away. Join verse 16 with it. But now, ye rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. He's saying that uh, the great mistake that uh, many people, many of these people were making, is that they forgot that they were just men and women of yesterday. And in fact, the psalmist says that our life is like an hand breath. That is why you stretch your hand from the tip of your little finger to the tip of your thumb. That's the hand breath. That that's how life is. And because you are not certain of life, because of the brevity of life, because of the uncertainty of life, it's God that knows. Therefore, you go to God and you get the plan from the Lord. Look at uh, Job chapter 8 verse 9. Job Chapter 8, reading from verse 9, telling us how we ought to be wise as we look at life. And we ought to go to the ancient of days, the God of heaven, the one that knows eternity from the very past, the one that knows the future even from the past. We need to go to him, and then he will direct us, and then we can plan aright. In Job chapter 8, verse 9, For we are but of yesterday, and know nothing, because our days upon the earth are a shadow. You understand that? You see, we don't know anything, but God has offered to help us. And Jesus is our Savior. And the Holy Spirit is the Comforter. And is living with us and abiding with us. And we do not need to go through life like orphans. Like people that do not have anyone that will counsel, that will comfort, that will direct. We can go to God and God will direct us. In Job chapter 14. Job chapter 14, reading from verses 1 and 2. Job chapter 14, verses 1 and 2. Man that is born of a woman is of a few days and full of trouble. He cometh forth like a flower and is cut down. He fleeth also as a shadow. And continueth not. You see, he's talking about the brevity of life. And he says, because life is so short. Number one, if you plan without God, and you go ahead of God, you will not get to the place you want to get to. You will have wasted a lot of time, and the time is so short. Not only that, you don't know what tomorrow will bring. There are many people that have uh, brought the whole fortune, all the income they ever had, and they put everything into a particular business, and everything sank into the bottom of the sea, and they cannot see anything now. That's why we need to be wise. If you had gone to God, God would have directed you. He would have shown you what to do, how to do it, when to do it, how and the where to do it, and then you will not have foolishly and ignorantly lost all the income you rake up for your whole life. In Psalm 39, Psalm 39, verses 4 and 5, calling out to wisdom, it tells us, it says in Psalm 39, verse 4, Lord, make me to know mine end and the measure of my days, what it is. That I may know how frail I am. Verse 5, Behold, thou hast made my days as an handbreadth, and mine age is as nothing before thee. Verily, every man at his best stage is altogether vanity. 
and you can see reasons as we're reading all those scriptures. Why you need to talk to God is the ancient of days. He's the wise one. He's the only wise God. And because of that, you go to Him, you pray to Him, you ask Him, how do I lead my life? What do I do in my life? And God will be able to direct you. Psalm 90. Psalm 90. In verse 9, Psalm 90, verse 9, the second part of verse 9, we spend our years as a tale that is told. It says, uh, have you seen anybody telling a story, it's telling a tale? And then it says, the time of our life is almost like the time it takes that person to tell that story, to tell the tale. That's why, uh, because it's so brief, because it's so short, we need to be wise so that we'll know what to do in life. In that same Psalm, verse 12, so teach us, to number our days, that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. And sometimes you'll meet a brother, you say, what are you doing now? And he says, well, I'm trying to sell such and such now. Ah, but you told me the other, just last year, this is what, what I have left that scene. And if you go into the history of the life of that brother, he's changed jobs about seven or eight times. He started this, he dropped it. Started this and dropped it. Started another one, he dropped it. And he claims to be born again. He claims to be a child of God. Doesn't God know how he ought to spend his time? How he ought to use his life? How to, or he ought to use his skill? Doesn't God know what he ought to do? God knows, but he will not ask God. And because of that, time, life is wasting away. He does this and drops it and draws another one and drops it. The same thing you find there among some of our students. They take this course, they say there's no way there, they drop it. They take another one, they say there's no way there, they, lo- uh, they, they, they leave it. Or sometimes they are, uh, they are giving admission in a particular place. And then they say, uh, they look at it without prayer, without planning with God, without asking God. They say, no, I won't do that. And then, while they lose that one, they expect another one will come. The one they expecting will come does not come. And then they say, if I had known, I would have done this. If I had known, it would not have been necessary. If you ask God, if you plan with God, if you allow God to be the master of your life, and the captain of your life, and the controller of your life. In Psalm 103, from verse 15, it says, as for man, his days are as grass. And as a flower of the field, so he flourisheth. And then in verse 16, he tells us, in verse 16, For the wind passeth over it, and it's gone. And the place thereof shall not know it anymore. And that's the reason we ought to actually uh, make sure that all our plans, all the things uh, we want to do, we put everything before God so that God himself will be directing us and God himself will be leading us as to how and when and where those things ought to be. Sometimes uh, the reason why we make such mistakes is that we look at ourselves now, we say, well, they're still very young, there's still a lot of time ahead of me. Even if I waste uh, some time, it doesn't matter how old I am, how old am I, uh, by the way, I can afford to still waste some time. And uh, we think that what is there today will forever be there. We think that the intelligence that is there today will forever be there. The beauty and the, uh, and the vitality that is there today, the sharpness that is there today, we think it will, it will ever be there. Look at Isaiah chapter 47. Isaiah chapter 47. Reading there from verse 7. Open your Bible. This is Bible study. Isaiah chapter 47 from verse 7. Thou said, I, I shall be a lady forever, so that thou didst not lay these things to thine heart. Neither did thou remember the latter end of it. You see many people, I'm still young, I'll be a lady forever. All the things I have now, they are there. And any time I want, I can get back to that thing again. Because of that, they do not remember there is a latter end. And they do not think of what might come. They do not go to God, who knows the future, and who is able to plan for them. Uh, let's read that uh, Proverbs chapter 27 once again. Proverbs chapter 27 verse 1. Proverbs 27 verse 1. Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day shall bring forth. 
as we have looked at all those references and trying to interpret and explain and understand and apply what James is telling us in James chapter 4. You will see that he was accusing those so-called Christians, those religious people, those people that were planning without God. He was telling them that they were presuming, number one, they were presuming on the brevity of life. They were presuming on the uncertainty of tomorrow. They were presuming that they had the intelligence, they had the know-how, the knowledge, which they didn't have. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time, and then it vanishes away. A poet put it like this, talking about time. He said, when I was a child of life and crept, and time uh, and wet, and time crept. Then he said, when as a youth I dreamed and talked, then time walked. Then he said, when I became full grown man, time ran. When old as still I grew, time flew. And soon I shall find him passing on, time gone. He says, that's how time is. When you are still very, very young, it will look like time is there. While you are creeping, the time is still creeping. The time is there. The time will never go. You have all the time you need to do whatever you want to do in life. And eventually time will stop creeping, start walking. And then time will start running. And then time will start flying. And eventually time is gone and it's nowhere to be found. That's the reason why we ought to be very, very careful because we cannot presume about the uncertainty, about the brevity of life with, uh, with precision, the complexities of life. Do not allow anyone to act or to speak presumptuously about today or about tomorrow and about going to such and such a city with absolute assurance. And the uncertainties and the complexities of life will not allow any of us to speak presumptuously about continuing there a year with infallible precision or about buying and selling and getting gain with perfect certainty. Man is ignorant of the future. And it's uncertain as to what time, what time will bring. The man who plans without God presumes much about life. That's the reason why we ought to be wise. So that by the grace of God, we'll plan with God and we will succeed in Jesus' name. Every man is dependent on God for the next breath. To plan without God or to boast of tomorrow... Or to be certain about the uncertainties of life is pride and sinful, evil arrogance. How does a believer act? What does a believer do? How does a believer plan his life? That leads us now to point number three. The priority of the godly. The priority of the godly. When James now, James chapter 4 verse 15. James 4 verse 15. For that ye ought to say, Ye ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. That means for a child of God, everything in the life of a child of God should depend upon the Lord. James is commanding us, he says, ye ought to say. Are you not a believer? Are you not a child of God? How can you talk? How can you plan? How can you go somewhere? How can you get involved in something without God getting involved and without God leading you? He ought to say, if the Lord will, if the Lord permits, if that's the plan of God for my life, if that's the purpose of God for my life, if that is the thing that is written concerning me in the book of God, we shall live, and then we shall do this or that. Our lives, our accomplishments depend entirely upon God. It's uh, because of His permission, and it's because of His plan that we live. The preservation of our lives till the next day, or the next year, or the next decade, depends on God entirely. Planning on what to do and how to spend a life that God has graciously given us must be known here with God's will in focus. Every plan and every action must be brought to the light of the plan of God and the purpose of God for our lives and for our existence on earth. We learn this uh, from two people, one from Paul in the New Testament and two from David in the Old Testament. Let me show you from Paul in the New Testament and see the attitude of Paul the apostle. 
everything he wanted to do, everywhere he wanted to go, every ministry he wanted to carry out, every project he had in mind, he subjected it to the final approval and the will and the purpose of God for him. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 18. Acts of the Apostles chapter 18, reading there from verse 21. Acts 18 verse 21. Here he tells us, in 18.21 But bid them farewell, saying, I must by all means keep this feast that cometh in Jerusalem. But, listen to this now, I will return again unto you. What's the next, what are the next words? If God will. That means he wanted to do it, but he said, I cannot do anything by myself. My life belongs to God. I'll be with you again if God wills. In Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1 verse 10. In Romans chapter 1 verse 10, it says, making request. If by any means now at length, I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. You see that? He was an apostle. He was saved. He was sanctified. He was filled with the Holy Ghost. He was an intelligent man. In fact, he was the most educated, most enlightened among all the apostles with all the education. He will not do anything by himself. If God wills. And then in Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15 verse 32. Romans 15, 32. That I may come unto you with joy by the will of God. That's it again. And you see Paul the apostle, he will not lean upon his own understanding. He will not say, yes, that's what I like to do. I have the strength. I have the intelligence. Nothing can hinder me. I have the faith. I have authority over the devil and nothing will stop me. I will do what I like to do. No, you are a man. You cannot talk like that. It's only if God wills, if God permits. In First Corinthians chapter 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, the beginning of verse 19. It says, but I will come to you shortly if the Lord will. I will come to you shortly. And I plan to come. But everything is subjected. Everything is uh, subject to the will of God for me. If the Lord will. 1 Corinthians chapter 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 7. For I will not see you now by the way. But I trust to tarry a while with you. What are the next words? If the Lord permit, can you learn from Paul the Apostle then and say, well, I'll not just be taking decisions by myself. I will do this. I will go here. I will jump there. I will run there. If the Lord permits, if the Lord wills. I told you, we have an example from the Old Testament. And we have an example from the New Testament. We've read the example from the New Testament, which is the example of Paul the Apostle. Let's look at the example now in the Old Testament, the example of David. No wonder that uh, man David, the Lord really blessed him and prospered him. And the will of the Lord was done in his, in his life. And the plan and the purpose of God was effected in his life. Because he put God first in everything, even back in the Old Testament days. In 1 Samuel chapter 23. 1 Samuel chapter 23. Reading from verse 2. Therefore, David inquired of the Lord, saying... Shall I go and smite these Philistines? And the Lord said unto David, Go and smite the Philistines and save Keilah. You will see here, David, he was, he was a person that he had killed Goliath. Strength was there. Power was there. Vitality there. Instruments of war were there. The weapons were there. Even though everything was there, he didn't say, I know I can do it. I've done it before. And I can achieve it. I'm an achiever. I said, should I go? Or should I not go? A Christian should not just be a person that will say, I'm an achiever. I know who I am. I'm the head. I'm not the tail. I will go there. Whether God plans it or not, I know I can do it. And I will do it. You will fail. You see David, he inquired of the Lord. That same chapter in verse 4. It says, then David inquired of the Lord yet again. The second time, he inquired of the Lord. He asked from the Lord. That was the habit of David. That's why he was really a man after God's heart. He will not take any decision. He will not go anywhere. He will not do anything except he knew it was the absolute perfect will of God. In 1 Samuel chapter 13. 1 Samuel chapter 13. Verse 8. And David inquired 
at the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him, Pursue, for thou shalt surely overtake them, and without fail recover all. He had lost quite a lot. If you read the beginning of that chapter, the loss was so much that all the men with him, they were weeping. And he himself wept sorely. And then he encouraged himself in the Lord. But instead of saying, well, they've taken away our wives, they've taken away the sons, they've taken away our property, and we know what to do, there's the right thing to do, we're going to pursue them. There are many people, if there is a problem, they will not pray, they will not ask God, they will not know what to do. They just say, I know the police station. And they just get to the police station immediately. They think oh, that one doesn't need asking from God. But you see David here, he knew what he had lost, but he asked God, he said, God, shall we pursue them? Shall we overtake them? And the Lord said, Yes, go ahead and pursue. In Second Samuel chapter 2. Second Samuel chapter 2. Reading there from verse 1. And it came to pass after this that David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go into any of the cities of Judah? And the Lord said unto him, Go up. And uh, David said, Whither shall I go up? He asked the Lord first, He said, Shall I go? God said, Go. And then he asked again, Where am I going to go there? It's not enough to, to say that, Well, God told me to go. Where did he tell you to go? There are many people that ruin their lives. They do not check off from God again. He told me go, but he has not told you where to go. But we are told in this verse 1, The Lord said, Go up. And David said, Whither shall I go up? And then he said, Unto Hebron. In First Chronicles chapter 14. First Chronicles Chapter 14. Here we are we're following the life of David. And you are seeing why David actually was a man beloved of the Lord. He wouldn't take a step. Don't you like that? When your children are at home, even though they are educated, when they will not take any step, they say, I'll go and ask daddy and mommy at home. They tell them in the school to fill a particular form and to sign it and to submit it immediately because it's surgeon. They say, no, I can't do that. I'll go and ask daddy and mommy at home. Or if it's a wife, uh, the wife is told to do something from the uh, maybe the family and and he says, well, uh, Christian family is not like that. I'm going to ask my husband at home. That husband will love that wife. And those parents will love those children. And that's why God loved David so much. He wouldn't take a step. He wouldn't go anywhere. He wouldn't do anything. He will want to check off from the Lord. In First Chronicles chapter 14. First Chronicles chapter 14. Reading there from verse 10. In verse 10, here we are learning about David again. And David inquired of God, saying, Shall I go up against the Philistines, and will thou deliver them into my hand? And the Lord said unto him, Go up, for I will deliver them into thine hand. As if that were not enough, you know there are people, if they ask God at the beginning, shall I do this, shall I do that? And God says, yes, go ahead, do it. Then if they want to not do any additional sin on that same project, they will not ask God, but not David. David must ask God again. Look at verse 13. And the Philistines yet came again, spread themselves abroad in the valley. Therefore David and Quiet again of God. You see, there are some other believers. They said, hey, there, there's no point wasting time. I, I, I faced that same situation before. When I asked the Lord, He told me to go. And these situations are risen now very, very similar to the other one. And I know what the answer of the Lord will be. Therefore, I am going to go. No, David will not do that. Look at that verse 14. <clears throat> Therefore, David inquired again. And God said unto him, Go not up after them. You see that? Here the Lord now was going to change the method and the strategy. He had told him to go before and he overcame. And when those same problems uh, arose again and he asked God, then God said, Go not up after them, turn away from them. And come upon them over against the mulberry trees. And it shall be when thou shalt hear a sound of going in the tops of the mulberry trees, that then thou shalt go, thou shalt go out to battle, for God is gone forth before thee to smite the hosts of the Philistines. In verse 16, David therefore did as God commanded him. He was not wiser than God. He was not wiser than counseling. He was not wiser than the commandment of the Lord. David therefore did as God commanded him. 
they smote the host of the Philistines from Gibeon even unto Gaza. Verse 7 is wonderful, marvelous, fantastic. It is very important. It shows you how this man actually made progress in his life. Look at verse 17. It says, And the fame of David went out into all the lands, and the Lord brought uh, the fear of him upon all nations. You see, if you will ask God, if you will tell God, I'm not wise, I don't know what to do, I, I want you to guide me, then the Lord will guide you. Come into the Psalms, look at Psalm 40. If you look at the top of uh, Psalm 40, you will see the title there, and you will see that Psalm 40 is a Psalm of David. And then as you read inside the psalm, you will see the attitude and the method uh, of David, the way he, he lived his life. In Psalm 40 verse 8, I delight to do thy will. Oh my God, yea, thy law is within my heart. That's what David said. He said, that's why I'm always asking God. That's why I want to know what he wants me to do, where he wants me to go. He says, I delight to do thy will, O God. Psalm 143. In Psalm 143 verse 8. Cause me to hear thy loving kindness in the morning. For indeed do I trust. Listen to the next part now. Cause me to know the way wherein I should walk. Do you tell God that? When you want to get married. When you want to go to our institution. When you want to take a course. When you want to choose something you are going to do. When you want to relocate to another city. When you want to have a project. When you want to resign and get to another job. Cause me to know the way wherein I should walk. For I lift up my soul unto thee. Then in verse 10 he says, teach me to do thy will. For thou art my God. Thy spirit is good. Lead me into the land of uprightness. I pray it will be so for every one of us in Jesus name. Why are we talking about all this? Why are we emphasizing all this? Why are we making the point and stressing it over and over again? Because in Jeremiah chapter 10. Jeremiah chapter 10 verse 23. Look at it. It's very important. Open it in your Bible. Jeremiah chapter 10 verse 23. O oh Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. Have you realized that? Do you know that God can make something beautiful, something good out of your life? Do you know that God can prosper you and he can take all the failures in your life and turn everything to success? If you will change and repent from today and you'll not just be jumping and running and climbing and doing this and doing that without asking him from the Lord. If you will say, Lord, I am sorry for all the bad, bad decisions I've taken, I planned without you as if I didn't know that God is wiser than who I am. And uh, it wasn't on me. But now I've realized I come to you, O Lord. Only what you want me to do will I do in my life. I submit my life to you. I tend everything before you. Anything that I've been planning, which is not according to your will, cancel it from tonight. I will follow you all the days of my life in Jesus' name. And your life will be beautiful. And you will be promoted. You will have progress. Things will be good in your life. Why don't you rise up and tell the Lord, I'm sorry. For all the mistakes I have made. Planning without you. Taking decisions without you. Running ahead without you. Going to some places without you. Seeking something there without you. Joining uh, so and so to make a business without you. Getting into agreement in marriage without you. Getting into agreement to travel somewhere without you. And I've already sustained a lot of losses in my life. Lord, I come. Lord, I come. Help me. I will no more do that. My life now is in your hand. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. You are saved. You are sanctified. You are baptized in the Holy Ghost. That's not an excuse. Ask the Lord, where do I go? How do I go there? What do I do? What work am I supposed to be involved in? Don't take the decisions before asking God. Let God have the privilege of taking the decisions for you. He is our God. He is our Father. He is wiser than us. He knows the way. He knows what we ought to do. He knows what will benefit our lives. And if you are not born again, call on the name of the Lord so you can be born again. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Confess all your sins to him. Tell him to forgive you. And the Lord will forgive you. There will be a mighty change in your life. 
and then put your life in the hands of God, then you will succeed because anything God is involved with will be a success.